I like the title of the conference, Quasicrystals, today. And what I like to convince everyone in the audience is that quasicrystals are everywhere today. So I think the impact that you made uh, has truly changed the face of science, uh, not only within the small, or maybe not small, but not confined to the community of, of uh, metallurgy and, and, and uh, systems made out of metals, uh, but really that we, uh, the knowledge of being able to have long-range order, which is not periodic, uh, has affected science tremendously. And I hope to convince everyone uh, about that point. Uh, before I forget, I've accumulated quite a few uh, collaborators over the years working on different aspects of quasicrystals. Of course, I won't name them all. I will just name the two who are sitting in the audience. Uh, my uh, student, Liron, uh, who is sitting, just raise your hand, uh, is working now with me on a collaboration with the group of Clemens Bechinger in, at Stuttgart University on colloidal quasicrystals. And Kobe Balkan, who is sitting right next to her, uh, is working uh, in collaboration with Chaim Diamant from the Chemistry uh, School of Chemistry at Tel Aviv University on uh, soft quasicrystals, and I'll mention both of these uh, systems in my talk. So I'm going to talk about what I like to call mesoscopic quasicrystals, and what is mesoscopic in these quasicrystals is the size of the building blocks from which they're uh, made. And there are generally two kinds of these uh, mesoscopic quasicrystals. Uh, the ones that are fabricated artificially, we just build them from these building blocks, and the kind that are self-assembled, uh, but we'd like to know how to control the self-assembly so that they uh, will generate the structures that we like to see. Uh, I'll mention some unique applications that are based on these structures, uh, and I'll try to uh, emphasize the fact that we can really use them to access new physics, physics that's difficult to access with atomic quasicrystals, uh, with metallic alloys, uh, but that we can actually see with these uh, with these systems. So I'll try to give a taste of things uh, that we do. Uh, as I said, the talk is an hour long, but I'll try to, uh, I'll try to be concise. Now before I start, uh, I just want to point out that one of the ways we do access new physics is by simulating atomic quasicrystals. So things that are difficult to see in, in an atomic crystal, uh, we might be able to uh, see if we probe these larger scale quasicrystals as model systems. And I think the first simulated quasicrystal uh, actually goes back to Alan Mackay, because Alan Mackay just arranged these circles on the vertices of a Penrose tiling because he didn't know how to compute the Fourier transform of the Penrose tiling, something we know how to do today, but that didn't stop him because you just take that and you perform optical diffraction, as we all know, and you are immediately convinced that you have long-range order here. I mean, you don't know rigorously that these are Bragg peaks, but they look darn, you know, like a, a, a real Bragg peaks, and today we know that they are real Bragg peaks. So uh, I'll start about talking about these artificially fabricated uh, uh, metamaterials or quasicrystals, and of course, uh, one can fabricate quasicrystals on a very large scale, what I would call a macroscopic scale. Uh, so these are these uh, sticks that have been used by, this, by the group of Paul Chaikin uh, to do uh, transmission experiments with uh, uh, microwaves. Uh, we have from the uh, group of uh, Walter Steuer uh, similar arrangements of steel rods or balls to uh, look at transmissions of, transmission of sound waves of phonons. Uh, of course, you're quite limited with the size of the system that you can make at these scales. So the natural thing to do is to go to a microscopic met metamaterial. So the scale that I would consider here an intermediate between the atomic and the macro, uh, the so-called mesoscopic scale. So what people did here, and I think this is one of the first uh, uh, photonic quasicrystals, is actually drill holes in a sheet of some material. I don't remember what it was. Uh, this is about a quarter of a micron in diameter, uh, and they um, produce some kind of a square triangle tiling uh, and use that uh, to obtain uh, photonic uh, band gaps, so uh, regions in frequency where uh, waves cannot be transmitted. And the idea here is that once you realize that uh, you're not limited when you want long-range order, you're not limited by periodic structures. You can take advantage of long-range order that is aperiodic. You can actually obtain symmetries that are not possible with periodic crystals. So the idea here is to obtain these photonic band gaps in as an isotropic manner as possible. You want to see the same kind of gap in every direction. If all you know about long-range order are periodic crystals, then the best you can do is with a six-fold structure. A hexagon is the closest you can get to a circle. But now with 12-fold crystals, which we can easily generate, 
uh, we can get a dodecagon, which is much closer to a circle than a hexagon is. So the idea is extremely simple. Uh, all you need to realize, and that's one of the things I was mentioning, uh, is that long-range order is not limited to periodic uh, structures. So, uh, but again, if I go back to this, this has to be fabricated one hole at a time. Uh, so this is very hard work. Another idea is an idea that was actually performed here at uh, the Technion in the group of Motisegev. And what they do here is they just perform an interference pattern of, uh, of light, of just laser beams. Uh, and this is uh, performed on a material that responds to the intensity of the electric field and changes its index of refraction. So if we look at this, uh, this is an, an, experimentally, an experimental picture of basically a map of the index of refraction of this nonlinear material. So as long as the beams are on, you really have a structure here, uh, which is a photonic quasi-crystal uh, with tenfold symmetry. Uh, of course, once you turn off the beams, it, it, it doesn't live for a very long time. But what you can do about that is when you have the beams there, uh, and here I've removed the material, so this is the experiments from uh, Clemens Bechingel's lab. You take an interference pattern of five beams, and what you do is you just take uh, a lot of tiny little uh, balls. These are plastic balls, about a, a micron in diameter. Um, they are attracted to regions of high electric field intensity, again, like, uh, like tweezers, like uh, the normal uh, uh, tweezers. And they basically sit at positions of maximum of the electric field. They generate this structure, um, again, induced by the external light that is performed, that is uh, uh, applied on it. But uh, one can actually freeze this structure if one wants. So you generate a structure like this. Uh, and instead of just having water, you put some sort of a, a polymer inside that you can then flash UV and it solidifies. And that thing uh, holds. Uh, quite well. I have a sample like that here. So here I have these colloids, these micron size uh, uh, particles, a gift from Clemens Bechinger. I just have to look for it. It's about a. Okay. okay. Sure I've been keeping this properly. Maybe the temperatures at Tel Aviv are not uh, the right thing. So it's, it's, a, it's a little strained over time. But you can clearly see that uh, one can actually generate these structures that will live for a long time uh, in this kind of uh, way. This is kind of an overview of these artificially uh, generated metamaterials and how you might go about generating them. And I'd like to say a few words about what you would do with them once they're generated. So as I mentioned, the idea is that we have structures with long range order or, or artificially generated structures that possess uh, this long range order, which means that they have Bragg peak uh, diffraction. But the fact is, the fact that we know that we're not limited to standard periodic crystals uh, indicates, for one thing, what I already mentioned, is that we can basically have arbitrarily high rotational symmetry. So OK, so we don't want to go to arbitrarily high rotational symmetry, but a 12-fold 12, 12 tiling is something simple that we really uh, know everything about. And this is already, as I said, quite close to a circle. And we really obtain uh, uh, um, uh, um, a much better result than we would with a periodic crystal. A different uh, aspect, and this is what I'd like to spend a few minutes explaining uh, 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 the idea about, is the idea that not only do we have arbitrarily high rotational symmetry, we basically can position the peaks in Fourier space wherever we want them to be. Okay? Uh, we're not limited to uh, 14 uh, Breve uh, uh, classes of lattices. We're not limited in positions where we can put the Bragg peaks. We can basically put them anywhere we want. And this helps in applications uh, with nonlinear frequency conversion. And let me just uh, explain how that works. So the basic idea is that you have a material which allows uh, to uh, have these nonlinear uh, interactions with light. So the basic, ba really simplest idea is you take red light, uh, two photons uh, with uh, the correct frequency, and they interact within the material. They basically annihilate, and a third photon is generated whose color is green. So it has uh, twice the frequency uh, of the individual uh, incoming photon. So idea is that uh, uh, the um, frequency or the energy of the uh, uh, outgoing photon is the sum of the energies of the incoming photon. That's uh, 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 some uh, conservation law that you have to satisfy. Uh, 
There's another conservation law, and there's momentum conservation. So the momentum of the outgoing photon also has to be the sum of the momenta of the incoming photon. And here's where the problem comes in, uh, and, and uh, engineers call this phase matching, but it's basically a problem that comes from the fact that the dispersion relation, omega of k, is not linear, and so you cannot satisfy both of these conservation laws at the same time. So if you look at K3 and you write K1 plus K2, there's always some missing momentum. There's also always a, a, a mismatch in this uh, uh, wave vector, and this is why engineers call it phase matching. It appears in the phase of the oscillating electric field. Um, so again, the idea is to use metamaterials which are long range order, and this is a very old idea. It's almost 50 years old, uh, because we know that in an ordered material in a crystal, we don't really need to satisfy momentum conservation. What we need to satisfy is crystal momentum conservation. So momentum needs to be conserved only to within a wave vector in the reciprocal lattice. So you generate an artificial material whose reciprocal lattice contains exactly this missing wave vector. Uh, just by artificially modulating this material, you get it in the reciprocal lattice and you're all set. And it works perfectly well. And uh, my friend at Tel Aviv tells me that all these green lasers actually work using this idea. So you use some solid state uh, device here to generate red light and then you multiply the frequency to get uh, the green light. So it really actually works very well. But now, the thing is that once you can do that, you want to be able to do more. So uh, in this example, uh, uh, I have a material where I want to put three different frequencies uh, from one side and have them all three doubled. But if I want to double three different frequencies, I need three different delta k's. I have three different uh, momentum mismatches. So now I need to generate something whose uh, reciprocal lattice has three arbitrary wave vectors in it. If I can do that, then I'm all set and I can do this thing. Um, and, and I like to call this reciprocal lattice engineering because this is what we're doing. And of course, we know how to do that. Um, and so now, engineering students at Tel Aviv University are reading Marjorie's book, Quasicrystals and Geometry, to learn how to use De Bruyne's grid method uh, and take any set of wave vectors and generate a real structure that will have those wave vectors in their diffraction pattern. So this is a, a, an amazing, I think, application of just the fact that you know that you can do it. And if you can do it, why not go ahead and do it? So this is a one-dimensional structure that basically implements uh, this uh, device here. <coughs> and th these are uh, uh, simulations and then actual experimental measurements where you see the output frequencies. It really works. So this is in one dimension. Uh, and we've also described uh, two-dimensional uh, examples. Uh, and just two <coughs> final remarks. So in general, when we have this reciprocal lattice engineering, we obtain a nonlinear photonic quasi-crystal. Sometimes it might happen that we get a periodic crystal, but that's okay. When we select Q to be this number, which is roughly 1.93, then again, this is wave vector is length is one, and the length of this is 1.93, we get a very nice 12-fold quasi-crystal uh, when alpha is sufficiently strong. When we slightly reduce the value of alpha, it uh, turns into a hexagonal crystal. And what did we never get here? We never obtained octagonal and decagonal quasicrystal, which was actually more important than everything else, because this allowed us to understand what was going on here. And the basic idea, as I said, if I look in Fourier space, then I know that the more amplitudes I add, the more Bragg peaks I add in the diffraction, the more I have to pay in energy. But whenever I have triplets that add to zero, I can gain a lot in energy. So this table here basically compares the number of modes I have and the number of triangles that I could close. So for eightfold and tenfold patterns, I just don't have sufficiently many triplets of wave vectors that add up to zero. I just cannot stabilize the structure. But for the 12-fold symmetric structure, I have a lot of triangles there. It's just the property of the number 12, and I can really stabilize the structure. So I understand now that what's going on here in the Faraday wave system is the fact that I have a combination of having two length scales. Well, that's something that we all understood. We know that to get quasicrystals, we need to somehow introduce two length scales. But the second ingredient is the fact that I have these three body interactions. Without them, I cannot stabilize these 12-fold patterns. And so the question is, where would they come here in the system of my cells that we're studying? So what we did here is we took our free energy, the general one that I obtained earlier, 
And we just expanded it in a similar fashion like I wrote in this uh, model for Faraday waves. And what we see here is that the entropy term that I had here, the C log C term, when I expand it, I get the three body term that is really important for me. Okay, and this is my energy term again. Um, so, so this is the term that in the Faraday wave model had those gradients and selected the two length scales. So as we see entropy is coming from, uh, the three body interactions are coming from entropy, the two length scales must come from the energy. So the question now is, should I take this magic number 1.93 as the value of R here? How many people say yes? Okay, you just don't want to commit. Well, the answer, of course, is no, because I just explained to you that the ratio has to be set in Fourier space and not in real space. Okay, it's that ratio 1.93 that I need between the wave vectors in Fourier space. So what I want to do is, again, this is my uh, energy term in that uh, uh, Faraday, mod Faraday wave model. If I Fourier transform it, every del, del squared brings down a minus k squared. And so I plot now u as a function of k. What you see is that I have these two minima and they're positioned at 1 and 1.93. So what I need in order to control the, the self-assembly of quasicrystals is to tweak the parameters of the pair potential so that when I, wait, when I Fourier transform it, it will have uh, two minima in Fourier space with roughly equal heights and a controllable ratio between their positions. So this is my pair potential, and we can actually find the values of U of R that give me uh, the first two minima that are deeper than all the rest that uh, are of equal height and have the right ratio. Now I can take more complicated pair potentials, uh, some that are more realistic, others that are realistic. Uh, the, whole, the idea again is all I need to do is to Fourier transform or ask Kobe to Fourier transform them and figure out the reverse engineering, so what should be the parameters of the potential that would give me uh, what I need here. And so uh, I think we explained the stability here. The stability stems from having two length scales, again, something we all always understood. Uh, but we need these many body, uh, uh, and the most important of these many body terms is this three body term, uh, and we're getting it here from the entropy. Um, we showed that very simple pair potentials can produce these quasi crystals, including this just very simple two-step potential. And the way we actually verified that uh, what we're claiming is correct is by going back to our original free energy, the full free energy, not the expanded one, and we insert the pair potential now that we know what the parameters need to be, and we basically minimize uh, the density in order to find uh, the most uh, 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 favorable structure. And this is the structure that we obtain. It's a little difficult to see. This is real space. Um, uh, I just want to point out that even though we're working with continuous functions here, we have a very sharply uh, distributed set of, uh, uh, of maximum points. And on the right-hand side, you see the Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform now is opposed to that simplistic Fourier, uh, a Faraday wave model that only had two rings of wave vectors. This has a, a huge set of higher harmonics that appear here uh, due to the nonlinear interaction of these three-body terms. Um, so uh, we verify this numerically. Uh, there's a preprint on the archive where you can see this. And of course, what we need to do now is to uh, maybe do some molecular dynamics or other kind of real particle simulations in order to truly test this. I mean, not just as a minimum of a free energy, but really uh, doing that. And this is ongoing work now with Michael Engel, who many of you know. Uh, we want to go to three dimensions also, uh, and maybe include real temperature uh, when we do that. Uh, we'd like to treat the other systems, those two types of particles and the ABC polymers, uh, and we are going to study uh, dynamics in these systems. This is all things that Kobe will hopefully do in the next uh, couple of years. Um, as a side point, uh, I really want to find an experimentalist who can produce particles with designed interactions, uh, give me the pair potential, or uh, give Kobe the pair potential, and, and he'll tell you how to design the interaction and hopefully this will produce a quasi-crystal. So I'd like to uh, finish by saying, uh, giving you some examples of uh, how we study the dynamics of quasi-crystals uh, using these mesoscopic scale uh, systems. So, uh, um, and I think I'll mention two things. One of them is to use the quasi-crystal uh, that we fabricate, uh, grow artificially, or, or in a, some sort of a, a self-assembled manner 
to study the dynamics of quantum mechanical wave packets under the influence of these potentials. Um, and of course, study the dynamics of the structure itself. So study excitations, phonons, phasons, uh, and look at defects, all the things we heard uh, about in the last couple of days. So let me go back to uh, the system here of the optically induced uh, uh, photonic quasicrystals in, in, in Moti Segev's group. Uh, what we did here at this point, uh, and that's uh, something that uh, uh, you can do once you set up um, this uh, uh, quasicrystal, uh, by these interfering, five interfering laser beams, is send in a, a, an additional probe beam. And you can send this probe beam, uh, since the dimensions here are micron size, you can really send it wherever you want. Okay? So the idea is uh, um, to pick two really points with different environments. Uh, this is a point of uh, local tenfold symmetric environment, and this is a point where the local symmetry is not uh, very uh, uh, clear. Um, this is just a theory of just pro uh, simulation of propagating the waves through, and these are uh, uh, real experimental images. So you send in a very localized Gaussian beam, uh, and you see how it diffracts through the material, and you take the image from the other side of the material. Uh, so here is the configuration in the symmetric point. Here's the configuration in the uh, asymmetric point. Um, these are really uh, initial uh, measurements, nothing quantitative came out of that, except maybe for the fact that in these materials, since these are nonlinear, uh, this is a nonlinear medium, if you crank up the intensity of the electromagnetic beam, you start seeing nonlinear effects of the uh, electromagnetism. And so at some point, instead of seeing the diffracting beam, which gives you this nice uh, tenfold ring, uh, all the intensity focuses to one point, which is what is called soliton a soliton in this, uh, in this field. Um, another thing that we like to do, as I said, is to uh, look at uh, dynamics of uh, dislocations, or at least uh, uh, see dislocations. And we saw nicely in the morning, so maybe I don't really need to explain this. Um, this is a simulation of that 12-fold uh, 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 quasi-crystal uh, that I mentioned earlier using that free energy that, uh, that we generated, that we wrote down. Um, this image actually has dislocations in it. And, and in periodic crystals, it's very easy just to look at the crystal and see the dislocations. Here, it's quite difficult to do that. But we do on the computer what uh, uh, Mark and, and, and do in the, in the lab. What we do is we Fourier transform this image. And then now you see that some of the Bragg peaks are really sharp, and some of the Bragg peaks are fuzzy. So the fuzzy Bragg peaks, the ones that gain information about the dislocation, uh, what we do is we filter out a single pair of these peaks, we just basically cut out everything else. So numerically, we can now run a simulation and see how they attract each other and annihilate, and the whole system relaxes back. Uh, uh, I won't show you that. What I want to show you is, are these experimental pictures from the work uh, that, that, that we did here. Uh, what you have here is an image of uh, dislocation that was generated in this uh, uh, um, electromagnetically induced uh, quasi-crystal. Uh, what you have here is what happens if you let this dislocation relax. So there's nonlinear interaction between the electromagnetic waves and the material, and they somehow uh, relax this dislocation, and eventually it goes away. Uh, if we crank up the strength of what induces the dis dislocation, then we see that it actually stays there for a longer time. Uh, these experiments are quite limited because all you can image is the initial state and some final state after some finite amount of time. You cannot really image the uh, way things evolve in time. So in order to uh, see different results, we just needed to change the initial conditions. That's, that's all we could do here. Another thing we did here is try to look at phonon and phason relaxation. Um, what we did here is, again, induce a dislocation in this structure here. So if you count the lines here, you'll see that there's a dislocation somewhere here. And what we look at here is not filtering one pair of Bragg peaks, but filtering two pairs that are related by the golden ratio. So now what I have here is the inverse Fourier transform of those two pairs. If everything were perfect, I'd see just a Fibonacci grid here. But you see that I have a lot of these jags because there's a lot of phason stream here. So the, the crookedness of these lines is indicative of, of phonon strain mainly. Uh, and these jags are indicative of having phason strain. And what we see here is what happens after the dislocation goes away. Uh, the system relaxes. 
Um, these lines look quite straight, so most of the phonon strain has gone away, but we still see some amount of jazz, some density of jags remaining here, which indicates, at least qualitatively, that uh, phasons uh, take a much longer time to relax, as uh, Mark explained uh, yesterday in a very general uh, uh, picture setting. And the last thing is this is uh, uh, ongoing research, uh, and my student Liron is involved uh, with this together with uh, people in, in uh, Clemens Bechingel's lab. Uh, this is now the uh, uh, colloidal system. Again, we induce the order using an external potential, uh, but these little particles are in water, so, and there's real temperature in the lab, so they do jiggle around uh, uh, as Brownian particles, uh, basically overdamped Brownian particles in this water. So what I'm showing you here is a movie uh, of these uh, particles, and you'll see that not only do they uh, um, fluctuate around their uh, local uh, uh, positions of uh, 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 equilibrium, but you can see every once in a while particles jumping between positions, and so we clearly see that we have both a combination of phonon fluctuations and phason fluctuations uh, in these systems. And so currently this is what we intend to do, uh, is to analyze these phonon and, and phason fluctuations uh, in this system. So I think I, I hope I've convinced you um, that really, Danny, you made a, a real impact, much beyond uh, metallurgy and, and, and atomic crystals, uh, because quasi-crystals, really, and I haven't said anything about mathematics or art and all these uh, side fields, uh, just in physics, in physics and chemistry and material science, uh, quasi-crystals today are everywhere. So, so I think uh, we all owe you a lot of thanks, and uh, I definitely personally owe you a lot of thanks. Um, and with that, I would like to end.